Thank you for Good morning. Good morning to you. Why are you gay? Who says I'm gay? Who says I'm gay? Uh, in their mouths. Yeah. Hey, oh. Hey, oh. Hey, oh. We have returned to the 40s to discover the roots of success. Speaking of roots, how about those African kids, huh? You are gay. You are... <laughs> you, you are gay. $17 to poop and pee all over these women. Oh, look. It's a... It's a, you know... It's a yellow-headed, pink-tailed booby. <laughs> uh. Ooh. Whoa. I don't want to suck that guy's dick. Look at him. He's got the little belly. He's got the uh, grown man tits. What the hell? Oh, hey. Yeah. It's time for fun facts. Yeah. Uh, and then what is this? This is a video. <laughs> Oh, they're Muslim, I see. Welcome to Pandering Hour. I am your host, Anthony Martin, and today on Pandering Hour, I think you can assume what we're going to be talking about. It's Russia. Uh, we're going to be talking about Russia ranked number 49 on the Human Development Index. Um, so, <laughs> that's that's Putin with a dragon off behind me. I don't know if you guys can see that. Very well, but um, yeah, I'm in a great mood today. Super excited for this. Um, I think I'm gonna open up more, most podcasts like this. Uh, this is a fun little thing I'm doing. And uh, if you watched the last episode, you may be aware of the tra- the Zen tragedy that happened. Uh, I almost died <laughs> from taking a Zen. I uh, the bag was ripped of my little Zen pouch, and I was eating the salts. And I was just hovering over my bathroom, or over my bathroom, over my toilet for like a good, I was hovering over my whole life. I was a, it was an out-of-body experience. Um, I have a new one, uh, and we're going to do it again. I do not, I'm not endorsed by Jan. This is not a good idea. Don't do this. Never do this. Never, ever. I look, I look stupid. Don't you ever do this. It's a bad idea. Fucking Putin. Fucking. This is what, this is what Putin's brought us to in Biden's America. Is that why hillbillies look like this? Because they have a dip in their lip? They're just like, let me tell you something, boy. Let me tell, let me tell you something. Motherfucker. Try and take my guns away? I'm moving to Russia. Hanging out with Putin. Fuck yeah, we're hanging out with Putin. I'm also drinking a coffee. This is kind of, this is gonna be so over the top. I have a, I have, let me roll up a napkin. So the second I start to feel this, I'm gonna spit it out. Oh my god, coffee and Zen. Am I out of my fucking mind? I think I'm gonna explode. Don't do this. I'm not sponsored. This is, don't, don't do this. It's not a good idea. It's dumb, but we're talking about Russia. Oh, now you can see what we're talking. Now I'm talking about Russia. Um, I think I should... I want to open with a, a word from Louis C.K. Now, um, Louis C.K. in an acceptance speech from The Moth. Uh, the Moth presents Louis C.K.'s Moth Awards acceptance speech. He talks a little bit about his trip to Moscow, and I think it perfectly encapsulates what people think about Russia, but also how Russians experience Russia. So I'm just going to let Louis C.K. give the the Russian introduction. Uh, Without further ado, uh, Louis C.K. The 2015 Moth Award to Mr. Louis (laughs) C.K. Thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I really like... It's a fist? That's a dildo, for sure. People. I'm sorry, that's... It's very childish of me to be like... even think that I'm pretty... That looks so much like a... Just a... You sit on it sort of award. Be cool sometimes. But uh, I really... Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here because I do love uh, the moth. I and I listen on enough. the radio all the time. 
and it kills me every time. I, it's nice to know that you can reliably cry by listening to something, you know? Always makes me cry. I don't want to thank the people who told their stories, the kids and all these people, because I think um, stories is the only thing that you have that's really only yours. A lot of people have money and uh, other possessions or ideas, but your stories are the only things that you're the only one who has them. And then just by telling them, then everybody else has them. So that's why I think stories are great. Uh, so they asked me to tell a story, and I, I told a few to my daughter. And this one, she just said, yeah, tell that one. <laughs> and I think it's mostly because she wanted me to stop. It was the last one. She's like, just tell that one. Can I go back to what I was doing? But anyway, I went to Russia in 19, no, 2000, no, when the fuck was it? Yes, 1994. I went to Russia, and it had just become Russia again. It was the Soviet Union until really that year. I know this feels a little lazy that I'm just watching Louis C.K. talk, but it's very it's very important to me that you guys watch this video, just because he's, Louis C.K. is my idol. He was the first uh, comedian I watched, really, other than like like the only comedian that I watched, and I was like, I like Louis C.K. and he is basically the template for everything, you know. Everything that I am, comedy-wise, other than obviously like the way I've built myself up to to be my own man, but Louis C.K. like like to to give you a gist of how important Louis C.K. is to me as like an I as not as like a person that I know, but as like the someone who inspired me. Um, when I I was so sure. And I, I'm still convinced that I'm going to die before I'm 30. Just because of some of the health issues I've been having. I uh, I mean, I was in the hospital for three months last year. I talk about it kind of a lot. I'm obnoxious. Um, it's The issue is with my heart and lungs. Which is not something that you can just replace. And I don't think I'll ever... I do, if I needed a replacement, I don't think I would get one. I mean, there there are children who need heart replacements, and then and who am I? I'm not. I'm no one important. I I've basically reserved a slot for me to die by the time I'm 30, and I'm 26 now, so I pretty much have less than three, less than four years, a little over three, to to get this whole comedy thing off the ground before I'm dead. And when I decided this and I was so sure that between now and 30 might not be enough time to become a comedian, I just sat on my couch alone and I just bawled my eyes out and I watched Louis C.K. Because I was like, well, what do I do? What is comedy to me if I'm not going to, if I'm not going to be a part of it? If I can't be a comedian, what is comedy to me? I mean, I've dedicated, I mean, I've dedicated my life to this since I was 18. What, what am I now? Um, and I, I'm a fan. I just love it so much. And I love Louis C.K. stand-up so much. And so, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why I want to watch this with you guys. I just really think this is a r really good combination of me, Louis C.K., and Russia. year, everything started to crash down. And at the time, I was a writer for the Conan O'Brien show. And I had written there for two years and I was burnt out and I didn't want to do it anymore. So I went to the head writer and I said, I have to quit because I think I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. And he said, take two weeks off and we'll pay you for the two weeks. And I said, okay, I'll do that. So I had nowhere to go and I thought, maybe I'll go to Russia. I really don't know why. I can't really explain any decisions I made then. Because I have children now, so you don't have to search when you have children. You're not like, oh, what, what could I do to enhance my life? You're just sort of compelled to do whatever comes at you at a certain age in life. But I was in my 20s. I had no wife, nothing. I had no girlfriend even. I just was this guy, and I had money from a TV job. And so I just said, I'm going to go to Russia, because when I was a kid, I used to read Russian novels, and I loved them, and I would open all the windows so I would be cold, and I wanted to be cold like they were. 
So I just decided I'm going to go. And also somebody told me that the wall had just come down in the Soviet Union and that Russia was a really crazy place at the time. So I said, I'm going to go there. I speak no Russian. I can't even look at the alphabet and understand what I'm looking at. There's no place more foreign to me than Russia. So I went. I went to Moscow, which is when you land in Moscow, it's just... I'm going to interject occasionally during his speech. Uh, there is, I, I know this guy who's half Japanese and half Russian. Biggest dickhead I've ever met. Always pretended like he didn't know my name, but always recognized me. And he was like, oh, you're, uh, what's your name? I hate that guy. <laughs> that, so that's my impression of Russian so far. Forest, and there's a city in the middle of just forest. It's terrifying. And as the plane goes down, you're like, no, 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 I didn't want to really do this. <laughs> and the whole time there, I couldn't fend for myself. It was already a country that was just broken in pieces. And the weirdest things happened to me there. And I just, they just became normal after a while. Like I went, I was in a restaurant and a waiter came up to me, not my waiter. And he said, Coca-Cola. And I said, uh-huh. He said, Coca-Cola, and I said, sure. I don't drink Coca-Cola, but I had learned by that point to just don't, just go, just do what they're asking you to do. Sure. So he went to the kitchen and he got a Coke and a can and he handed it to me and he said, five dollars, because only dollars were worth anything there. And I said, okay, on my bill. He said, no, five dollars, me now. So I gave him five dollars and he put on his coat and he left. He just sold me a Coke on the side and then quit his job. So those are the kind of confusing moments I was having there. And I couldn't talk to anybody and I was so lonely. It's difficult. I mean, I was alone and I just sit in the room and go, okay, that was a really fucked up day. I hated that day. And I tried to watch television and the TV was American shows like Dynasty. And the way they translate, they didn't have, uh, the, what they did was the sound is a little down and there's just one man saying all of the dialogue in <laughs> over the whole show. I was there for two weeks and it just was crushingly, I had made no contact with anyone. And then one day I went into the subway. Now, if you've never been to Moscow, the one thing I learned there is that, well, the streets are very, I can't gesture with this thing. It's beautiful, but I can't keep punching you in the face with a big white fist. Okay. The streets in Moscow during the Cold War, they were made wider so that they could uh, have missiles go down the middle of the street for the parades. And if you go there, you'll find out if you go behind the big buildings, they actually tore the buildings off of their foundations and dragged them back. And a lot of the bigger buildings in Moscow, in the back, they're being held up by like bricks. It's really unnerving how unsafe the whole city is. So the streets are very wide and you can't cross the street on a green light. You'll never make it. So they made tunnels so you can go under, and those are connected to the subway. And the subway in Moscow, you go down in an escalator and you keep going until you think, I, this is, the, it just keeps going. Like, this is so deep, this is really upsetting. <laughs> but anyway, everyone hangs out in these tunnels. I went in the middle of December. I went to Russia in the middle of December, alone. And I'm standing in the subway, and I'm watching a violin player. And the one thing about Russia still today, I think, is that no one has any money. So when you see a guy playing the violin in the subway, he's like the first chair violin for like the Russian symphony orchestra, because that doesn't pay shit. And at least he can get a few kopecks in the subway. So I'm watching him and everybody, these other people are sitting on the floor and we're crying, everybody's crying. <laughs> everybody, it's just normal. People are just watching just wiping away tears. And there's a young fella sitting here, and he looked my age, I was 25 at the time, he looked about 25, and he was tattered and just watching this violin player. And then this group of kids walked by, about eight children, 
ranging from five to ten years old, and their faces were dirty, like, you know, like an Oliver Twist, like they were in a play. Like they had rubbed dirt on their face. And they're all wearing men's coats that they're wearing as like a, like, you know, from the neck down to the floor. And none of them have sleeves, their hands in their sleeves. Their sleeves are just flopping. They were like street urchin kids. And the coats, it just looked like these men's coats. And you kind of knew all the men who owned those coats are dead. <laughs> and at least one of these kids killed those guys. <laughs> like, I swear, I looked at an eight-year-old's face and thought, he has murdered. And that's what they looked like, just tough little kids. And I could, I'd seen them before in Moscow. They work in groups. The guy sitting below me that I identified with called out to the head kid in the front. I don't speak Russian, so I just knew he was going, uh, he's appealing to him. He needed something. And the kid with his hands in his sleeve looked at him suspiciously and said, like, what the fuck, why, what do you want from me? And the guy went, duh, 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 explaining himself, and he showed that his shoe had come apart. And he showed that his shoe was like a flap, and he showed the kid, duh, 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 and he showed him his shoe. And the kid shrugged and said, duh, 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 like, okay. And the kid's hand appeared from out of the sleeve, and there was a, a tube of shoe glue in his hand. <laughs> he didn't rummage for it, it was already there. And he handed it to the guy, and the guy fixed his shoe with the glue, gave it back and just did it. And then the kid from the other, he took another, his other hand had a paper bag, and he put the glue in, and he, and he huffed it. And his eyes rolled back, and he got high. And then the group kept going, and I couldn't believe what I just saw. That the misery in this country at that time was so calculable and so predictable that this guy thought, my shoe's broken. Oh, there's a child. He's sure to have some glue in his hand because the state of our nation is so wretched. And I looked and he looked at me and I, and I was startled and then he laughed and I laughed. And he's the only person I had any contact with in the whole of the Soviet Union. And I realized this is why I came here, to find out how bad life gets, and that when it's this bad, it's still fucking funny. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you. Ah, oh, such a fucking good speech. Such a good speech, man. So, just like, I, I'm, I'm a Louis C.K. fanboy, 100%, but that is one of my favorite things Favorite pieces of... Ah, uh, come on, camera, you fucker. Ah, no! Come on! Get locked in. I'm trying to talk here. Oh, no. Fine, look at Putin. Um, There we go. But Louis C.K. is one of the greatest... He To me, he's the greatest comedian alive. It, despite what Dave Chappelle may feel. <laughs> uh, I think he is the only person still doing comedy and still getting better at comedy... Despite his many, many years. Because so many people just stop. They just stop getting better. It's a common occurrence. You watch a comedian special and they're that good for the rest of their life. And that's kind of how good you need to be to make a living. But I, I want to get better. I want to be better. One of my favorite pieces of comedy anything to exist. Um, so that's how I feel about Russia. So that is my informed Russian, informed American opinion about Russia. And I kind of pulled up a couple graphics while we were doing that. I want to look into what he was mentioning about did the roads in Moscow get pushed back to get pushed back for missile silos? I don't know how to spell a silo. Um, oh, this is all just like... 
What is this? In like the 80s? Uh, I think Google's just going to keep showing me stuff about like what's currently going on in Russia, unfortunately. Mm, I'm blundering on the brink. Okay. Whatever. Let's look at some interesting and surprising facts about Russia. Okay. World's longest railway. Who cares? Home to a lot of famous literature. Actually... One of the, the, the brothers, Karamazov, Karamazov, yeah, this is supposed to be like one of the greatest books of all time, and it has these great, great like uh, quotes. My Fyodor Do, uh, Dotevsky. Above all, don't lie to yourself. A man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie becomes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth from the truth within or around him, and so loses all respect for himself and others. And having no respect, he ceases to love. What is hell? I maintain that it is the suffering of being unable to love. I love mankind, he said, but I find to my amazement that the more I love mankind as a whole, the less I love man in particular. Like, these are all, like, what feel like truths. Like, just things that I've felt myself. Because I definitely, I feel like I might have articulated it on this podcast. Like, the more I try and, the more I am inspired by my fellow man, the more I am disappointed by them. Like, when I meet, when I meet other Americans, I'm just like, man, you, you are just not enough (laughs) for me. You, I wish you were just more, more of something. Not like, not richer, but like, if you're not rich, will you at least have enough character to to classify yourself as decent? But I think that, that, and if you're, and if you're rich, then I, it's hard for me to assume that you're decent. I, I criticize my fellow man so much, and I think, and as well as myself, and I think the Brothers Kar, uh, Karamazov has a lot of quotes that, just like I, I don't know. I just love these quotes, and I, I have the book. I just haven't read it because I'm a fucking poser. <laughs> I, I am. I'm a total, total poser. I'm 100% just like a, like oh I, the brother's charisma. Remember enough? All right. I didn't want to have to do this. How do I say? Kara, Kara What the fuck is the name? Karamazov. By Dostoevsky. In Russian, for reference, it said as Karamazov. 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 I have the brothers Karamazov, but I haven't read it because I'm a poser. And I like the quotes and. I get to go, yeah, yeah, that part of the book, I like that part of the book. And so I like the book. And now I can talk to people about it. And people are like, have you read the Brothers Karamazov? And I get to be like, oh, this quote, yeah. Uh, I think the devil doesn't exist, but man has created him. He has created him in his own image and likeness. And I'm not too, eh. There are a lot of really good quotes. And I want to find the time to read the book. I really just have to find the time to not be on my phone, which I never have time to not be on my phone. Um, also, Russian women. Most beautiful women in the world, I have to, I mean, I gotta say. Like, I'm not saying that as like a, I don't know. Like, I don't think I've ever, after all of everything I've done, I'm just mumbling around. Russian women are, seem to be the best. And I think it's because they're on the juice. I think they're on steroids. Uh, Russian women on steroids. Yep, it happens. Doping in Russia, for sure. Systematic... Oh, that's another thing I should talk about. Um, Russian Olympics steroids. 
Um, in 2008, seven Russian track and field athletes were suspended ahead of Summer Olympic Games in Beijing for manipulating their urine samples. Multiple Russian biathletes were involved in doing offenses in run-up to 2010 Winter Olympics. The president of the International Biathlon Union, uh, Anders Besberg, Bes we are facing systematic doping on a large scale in one of the strongest teams in the world, reviewing 7,289 blood samples from 2,737 competitors. From 2001 to 2009, a report found that the number of suspicious samples from country A notably exceeded other countries. One of the authors said country A was Russia. In October 2009, International Association of Athletics Federation General Secretary Pierre Weiss wrote to Valentin Baleknichev that blood samples from Russian athletes recorded some of the highest values ever seen since the IAAF started testing, and that tests from 2009 World Championships strongly suggests a systematic of abuse of abuse, systematic abuse of blood doping or EPO-related products. Um, and if you don't know what EPO is, I'm pretty sure. Like anabolic steroids, EPO's competitive advantage lies in its ability to boost the body's natural production of cer certain materials. Um, and I believe it's red blood cells. Um, EPO steroids in cycling. Um, cycling at night. Yeah. Get out of here. Uh, is it true that some professional cyclists' blood is so thick that they have to wake themselves up at night to avoid cardiac arrest? Is it possible to achieve this state naturally, or is this evidence of blood doping? It's not true that professional cyclists wake themselves up in the night to avoid cardiac arrest due to thickened blood. While it is true that some athletes have been known to engage in blood doping, which involves artificially increasing the red blood cell count to enhance performance, this practice is unethical and banned in competitive sports. Thickened blood can also lead to serious health risks, and it's not a state that can be achieved naturally without potential harm to the individual. It's important for athletes to prioritize their health and seek performance gains through legal and ethical means. Shut up. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta do things the right way. Shut up. We're talking about Russia. Number one in corruption. I imagine. Uh, other, I mean, we might be, as an American, we might be beating them. Um, is Russia first in Corruption. Uh, the country ranked first is perceived to have the most honest public sector. Russia is ranked 137th with a score of 28. For comparison, worldwide score the best score ranked 90, ranked first. Um, hold on, what is this? Where where is this ranked from? Uh, which countries are seen as the most corrupt? Um, Lebanon is ranked 10. Bangladesh, Belarus, Myanmar, El Salvador. Oh yeah, El Salvador. Zimbabwe, Mexico, I believe it. Colombia, I believe it. Iran, Russia. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And with that, how about the Russian mob? Russian Oh, what was there there's actually a good amount of Russian crime in the, where is it? I wanna say Croatia, Hungary, Latvia, and Slovakia. A lot there's a lot of organized crime that are like Russian gangs, I suppose. I was reading a little bit about that. I don't remember too much about it. Um how organized crime Gangsters Paradise, how organized crime took over Russia. Under Vladimir Putin's gangsterism on the streets, oh, under Vladimir Putin, gangsterism on the streets has given way to kleptocracy in the state. Uh, 
Uh, I was in Moscow in 1988 during the final years of the Soviet Union. The system was sliding down towards shabby oblivion, even if no one knew at the time how soon the end would come. While carrying out research for my doctorate on the impact of the Soviet war in Afghanistan, I was interviewing Russian veterans of the brutal conflict. When I could, I would meet the uh, Afghansi short... Hold on. The, you know what this reminded me of? Uh, who's the fucking Russian... Russian, uh, they're like contract killers. What are they? They're, uh, mercenaries. Have you guys seen these memes? We're going to get into that in a second. Um... Meet these Afghansi shortly after they got home, and then again a year into civilian life to see how they were adjusting. Mostly came back raw, shocked, and angry, either bursting with tales of horror and blunder, or spikely or numbly withdrawn. A year later, though most had done what people usually do in such circumstances, they had adapted, they had coped, the nightmares were less frequent, the memories less vivid, but then there were those who could not or would not move on. Some of these young men collaterally damaged by the war had become adrenaline junkies or just intolerant to the conventions of everyday life. One of the men I got to know during this time was Vol Volodya, weary, intense, and morose. He had brittle and dangerous quality at that. He had a, br oh, had a brittle and dangerous quality at that. On the whole, I would have crossed the road to avoid. He had been a marksman in the war. Another Afghansi I knew tolerated Volodya but never seemed comfortable with him, nor with talking about him. He always had money to burn at the time when most were eking out the mo uh, He always had money to burn at the time when most were eking out the most marginal of lives, often living with their parents and juggling multiple jobs. It all made sense, though, when I later learned that he had become what was known as <clears throat> Russian crime circles as a torpedo, a hitman. Fuck yeah. I've thought about being an assassin. I feel like I'd be I'd be decent at it. Um, and then I I talk I I have a friend who has uh, experience in crime, and he's like, you wouldn't like being a, an assassin. And I was like, oh really, really I I you really say so? And he's like, I know people who do that who did that stuff. He's like, they're they always they don't end up well basically is what he said he's like they don't live long and they don't live well um let's move on to this i want to talk a little bit about the source of this meme uh punished venom progosian <laughs> um arm within your insights first three months oh yeah what is it with this sub and its obsession with progosian it's so baffling it's funny now uh, the sub creams their collective pants whenever they see someone wearing an eye patch IRL. We get Dan Crenshaw posts every other week. Uh, he's the uh, Republican senator with the with the eye patch. He was um he was in the military. He lost an eye. Um, there's this whole thing with Pete Davidson where he said he looked like an assassin in a porn movie, and then the guy came on SNL. In this case, though, Prigozhin is the leader of the PMC that commits war crimes in Africa and even tried to stage a coup. If you don't know about this, the, basically, during this whole Ukrainian war, the PMC was like, I'm, I'm done. You're, Putin's a fucking asshole. We're, we are the, the Russian army, and we're just going to take it back. And so they were barreling towards Moscow. They got really close, and then they made a deal, and then they tried to kill Prigozhin. And he lived. Uh, there are some big differences. Big Boss isn't a neo-Nazi, and Prigozhin's reasons for his coup against Putin were far less sympathetic than Big Boss's coup against Zero. If you don't know Big Boss, I need to like have like side-by-side -side Solid Snake and uh, Prigozhin lore. But now there's an actual substance to the comparison between Eye Patch. Warner's flag even has a skull on it, a la Outer Heaven. Um, he's like IRL Big Boss. I don't know why anyone in the sub points out similarities between this guy and Big Boss. While, yes, they were both leaders of PMC, PMCs, one is a neo-Nazi while the other one isn't some people would point out to the swastika in MG1's Outer Heaven flag. But to be exact, 
that is reverse swastika and not the neo-Nazi one that you see reverse... Wait, what? Okay, this, these people are getting like, um, um, actually... I don't care. Oh, this is on Twitter? Prigozhin is like Solid Snake, but a bit more cringe. Okay, this is not helping me at all. Okay. Let's jump back to doping. I am curious to see what's going on on, like, Russian news. I want to see some, like... So where do they get their news? Since 1904, TASS has been Russia's long-standing news agency for more than 113 years. I had heard something. How do Russians feel about Russian news? How do Russians feel about the war? That's a great one. Overall, researchers say that they tracked just a 9% fall in support over the war for the war over the last year. The number of respondents who say Russia should cease hostilities while maintaining the occupied territories has more than doubled since last summer from 11 to 28 percent. Okay. Can Russia afford the war? They can't afford to lose the war. You're in too deep. Jailed as collaborators, stories of Ukrainians who end up in prison. Uh... Russian labels, veteran food, foreign agent. Holy shit. The Moscow Times? What is the Moscow Times? I wouldn't trust that. <laughs> Independent news from Russia for 30 years. Reporters detained at Moscow protest by soldiers' wives. Aww. At least five dead in Ukrainian shelling of occupied city. White scarves and flowers, wives and mothers of mobilized soldiers take resentment to the Kremlin. Uh, drone attack sent, sets Russia refinery ablaze. Um, wow. So, it, this is going to... Going back to bro science, is Khabib... Where is Dagestan? So Russia, this is Russia, this is Russia. It's Russia. Yeah, it's definitely Russia. The Republic of Dagestan. That's not bad. This place looks pretty nice. That doesn't look great. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Khabib is the... Uh, he was a champ for a really long time undefeated, like the number one guy, he's super fat now, just blew up the UFC entirely, the Russian Eagle, he is from Dagestan, he brought this whole wave of Dagestani fighters to America, and I was under the impression that they were like living in a hut somewhere, okay, well that's what I'm talking about, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about, but that's a decent house. Where exactly is Khabib from? And now Khabib lives in like Dubai or something like that. Sildi. Oh, there's a video. Oh, they're right, Muslim praying. Yeah. Tight 
tiny, tiny town right on the border of uh, Jordan, Georgia. Tiny, man. Is there? There's no other pictures. That's the only thing Google has on Sildi. Wow. Okay. So, let's go back. They have 12 active volcanoes. Fine, sure. Siberia makes up a majority of the land, but it's like uninhabitable. Russians have plenty of superstitions. Uh, Russia has one of the world's busiest metros. Yeah, because it has to be. How are you going to get anywhere if everything's frozen? Uh, Tetris was invented in Russia. Uh, Russians learn not to smile. What? Another one of the best Russian facts is that Russians learn not to f smile while growing up. While smiling may, while sw smiling in many cultures is a sign of happiness and friendliness, Russians don't view it that way. To Russians, smiling is a sign of weakness and not showing one's true feelings. Russians do smile at people they know well and care about, but not strangers as many cultures do. I feel like that's kind of starting here in America, too. Like, let me see. Do Americans smile? Okay, no, I guess Americans smile all the time. Um, I don't know. I just feel like, as someone who works in, like, a service industry, and I do customer service, it just seems like like no one smiles I just don't I don't believe that that whole like oh we're a very smiley country everyone's so happy to be here I I meet so many people who just have sort of like dread they ooze despair and a sorrow and a, and a loneliness that's really tragic to me um, Russia is a is the largest country by landmass 54% of the Russian population is female, but they're all grandmas. Uh, folk dancing is a tradition in Russia. 20% of Earth's trees are in Russia. I mean, that's beautiful. Coldest village in the world. Russia sold Alaska. My friend from Alaska says that like he gets tons of Russians. Uh, are there a lot of Russians in Alaska? Uh, da, da, da. Okay. No, that's not good. All right, I'm gonna give my own first-hand account. Uh, so <laughs> oh, I forgot about Putin. So my friend who lived in Alaska said that during this whole Ukraine thing, he was terrified. And a lot of people were scared that Russia could just hop over and take back Alaska. Like, it was a real concern for him. He was genuinely afraid that this whole this whole war between the U.S. and Russia and U.S. supporting the Russian and Ukrainian war was going to turn into, like, a reclaiming of multiple territories. Obviously, going to war with Ukraine is different than going to war with Russia or with America, but it was a concern nonetheless. He said that there's a very strong Russian presence in Alaska from his experience. Um, he, he is from Anchorage. One percent. Nelson Lagoon is forty-one percent Russian. Where is that? I mean, that's that's in there. Okay. Russia has eleven time zones. That's fucking huge. Hold on, I want to see how big Russia really is. Oh, up close, huh? Um. True size world 
map. It's way bigger than the United States. It's huge. And Alaska is a Alaska's a pretty big chunk actually. But like look at that, man. It's almost like two Americas. And that it's still like half of Africa. Like this is what drives me nuts. It's like if you look at America in comparison to Africa, that's, you know, one America. Probably two, three, almost four Americas is what makes up Africa. Uh, lake Baikal has more water than any other lake on Earth. Uh, oh, and that's it. That that's all the fun facts. Okay. There are some pretty Russian athletes on steroids, and and where to? get them. <laughs> no. Let's see. Isn't she a figure skater? The announcement that Camilla Valiva, the 15-year-old Russian figure skating star, had tested positive for a banned substance echoed another dark Olympic era. And it sent a chilling reminder that female athletes in certain sports have long been considered disposable in countries that support state-sponsored doping. Uh, from the late 1960s to the late 1980s, East, German, East Germany, a country of fewer than 17 million people, um, kept the pace in the Olympics medal chase with the U United States and the Soviet Union with a systematic doping known as the bland euphemism supporting means. Okay, let me see. But I want to see the... Oh, I can just go to images. Duh. I'm like, I want to see these people. How can I see the dopers? Yeah, look at this. God damn. No balls. Um, This lady. God damn. I want to look like that. Most people who dope aren't Russian athletes. That's true. There's mostly It's mostly just like young Americans. Oof, you got fucked up. Let's see. Hold on. How many Americans are on antidepressants, steroids? Three million to almost three percent of young Americans. How many men between the age of, let's say, eighteen and thirty? Okay, I'm not using this website. Okay, a league of their own demographics, motivations, and patterns uh, in use of 1,955 male adult non-medical anabolic steroid users in the United States. Uh, methods, let's go back. Recruitment methods. Internet posts. A URL, URL. A URL link to a web-based survey was posted on 12 online message boards where steroid discussion is commonplace. The message board attracts a broad range of individuals to discuss topics such as bodybuilding, strength, fitness, diet, nutrition, nutritional supplements, sports, and NMAAS use. A link was also placed on educational site 40, operated by one of the authors. These materials are known to have migrated uh, from their original sites, although the full extent of migration is unknown. Mass emails, etc., etc. Instrumentation, data analysis, results. Okay, a lot of white guys are on steroids. 
evidently. Holy shit. When was this done? This was from 2007? 2007. No way, dude. I need something, like, from today. Uh, 2023. Okay, this was from September 22nd of 2023. Uh, anabol anabolic steroids or androgenic steroids are commonly prescribed in primary care for a variety of chronic conditions, including primary hypogonadism, delayed puberty in males, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, gonadotropin, and luteinizing hormone-releasing deficiency, pituitary hypothalamic access dysfunction from various tumors, injury, radiation, just to name a few. As a primary care provider, uh, we may forget the dangers that are associated with the use of these anabolic steroids that are obtained illegally. Anabolic steroids are classified as Schedule Three controlled substance by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, making possession without prescription illegal. Um, testosterone has had has an effect on several processes in the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. Okay. The largest population known for this abuse uh, is adult males between the age of 18 and 30. I knew it! That's why I said that number, or that age range. Growing rates are recognized across all populations. Uh, the most astonishing growth is noted in American youth as young as 12 and females across all age groups. Uh, the National Institute for du Drug Abuse... For drug abuse... <laughs> has reported that at least 12% of high school athletes and 2% of middle school athletes admit to use abuse, which means it's got to be like 4%. 15% of NCAA athletes report abuse. 90% of athletes report abuse over their careers, most of them utilizing them for the same reason. Muscle bulk and fat loss at accelerated rates that result in performance enhance enhancement. <clears throat> Uh, with each population, risk factors differ in prepubescent males. The most notable risk involves with the abuse is stunted growth. Due to the early con uh, early closure of epiphysis, epiphysis, Office of Commissioners, an adult male and female risk include erythro... Da -da 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 I get the risk factors. Yeah, be careful. I get it. But this must mean that, like, it's it's going up. Stewards linked to long-lasting heart disease. Did it, did they ever figure out what killed um, that one guy? There was a recent um, athlete deaths body builder. Chad McCary, no. There was this guy who died recently. He had like alien gains. Joe Linder. Joe Linder death cause. Yeah. So although the cause of the aneurysm is unknown, experts suggest that at some people that some people are born with it and it can be hereditary. According to the American Heart Association, a family history of aneurysm may increase risk. Other factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and tobacco can use can increase the risk as well. Um, an aneurysm. Okay. Okay. There was like a conspiracy about it though, right? Conspiracy. His doctor recommended plasmapheresis as a way to improve his blood count. The presence of microclots detected by a D-dimmer test after he had received four vaccinations had sparked a controversy theory, uh, sorry, controversy, conspiracy theory among his fans on whether vaccination against COVID-19 was partly to blame for his death. That's scary. But to be fair, he was also on a shitload of steroids. I don't know if you saw that picture. The guy is ungodly shredded. Like, look at him, man. Look at it. Look at him in the fucking In and Out, man. Does that looks like the In and Out in Burbank? Like, good lord. Um. 
And then there's that, like, the video I was just pulling up. He was, like, known for doing that, like, making his chest muscles, like, do the wave. It's super cool. Kind of creepy. Um, I'm going to end the episode there. Thank you so much for watching. Um, praise Putin. Um, Progrosian, hit me up in the DMs. Goodbye. <laughs>